morning, everyone. Uh, Anna, that was just a beautiful introduction. I wish you could say that to me every morning. Just gets my spirits up, makes me feel like a good person. Frankly, I know I'm worth it. I know you guys are worth it. We're going to have a lot of fun today. So, so welcome back, 4th of July. We're halfway through the year. Um, you know, COVID is dramatic. All of these things are dramatic. And everything that we're experiencing right now, there's going to be agents that either thrive during this time or put their head in the sand and say, hey, I can't do this. I can't do that. So looking at today's class, List Like a Boss, the entire reason I created this class, and I've been teaching this almost for five years now, this exact class, it's gotten prettier over time, thanks to Anna, but uh, it's, it's a class that is the core of our business, which is listings. And if you can be an expert or a boss at taking listings, you're gonna be able to not only survive in any market conditions, but you're gonna be able to thrive. So I'm gonna take you through my process, what we've learned over the last 20 years from top producers across the country, uh, from the best coaches, from everything that we've learned, we've compiled this entire process and I know it'll help you have great success as well. So uh, as Anna said, I am Brendan Bardick. I always kind of start out a little bit with who I am and how I got here. So started out as an assistant to a top producing agent, became an agent on her team, became an individual agent, started a team, uh, from there, became the number one agent at Coldwell Banker, left Coldwell Banker, became the number one team at Keller Williams, um, had the opportunity to be able to purchase our amazing brokerage, was able to do that. And in my free time, I have a wonderful real estate coaching company where we help some of the top agents across the country become elite. So that's me. Let's jump into what you came here for, which is list like a boss. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna jump off. Feel free to ask questions at any time, jump on the chat box. The more interactive this is, a lot more fun it's going to be. And let me get this here and there we go. All right, so Anna, you can see that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Can you go ahead and get into presenter mode? We can still see the, the ribbon on the PowerPoint. Okie dokie. There we go. Oh. <laughs> How's that? Uh, still the same. Oh, that's presenter view. Okay. So what view do you want me in? There, I thought that oh, was the one. Whatever you just clicked, it kind of popped up and then kind of popped back. So. Yeah, um, not not sure. That's why I didn't do it this okay. way. But anyway, okay. I know how to do it. So cool. How's that? Uh, there we go. Perfect. Oh. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. All right. So let's start out with the mindset of how I approach every single listing appointment, okay? In today's uh, class, we're gonna be covering every single piece on basically the process from start to finish, how to pre-qual, how to uh, get prepared for the appointment. Uh, we're gonna show you exactly what we do step by step, but in this, the mindset and the preparation for it is the biggest piece. So when I start out, I look at every listing appointment. I don't care if it's a friend, a neighbor, a cousin, um, a cold call, a for sale by owner. How would I prepare and what would I do for a million dollar opportunity? And what I've learned uh, from studying this is we get paid in a really good amount of money. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but a really substantial amount of money to be excellent at being interviewed. So if you really look at your business and you studied and you said, I want to become really good uh, at my uh, real estate sales professional you know, you know, career, you get paid to be a really good presenter, right? So you, you get paid to interview. So the better you are at interviewing, the more money you're going to make. So one of the things I always tell everyone is read every book you can on how to ace interviews because you're either interviewing for a seller to be their agent, or you're interviewing for a buyer to be their buyer's agent. At some point, you're going to be interviewing for that job. And the better you are at it, the more money you're going to make. So how would you prepare? What would you do for a million dollar job interview, right? So, you know, we always think of that image uh, with Will Smith and, you know, you know, getting ready to go on this interview. And I was just trying to drive home that point of this all starts out with the steps that you take to prepare. 
So number one is you're going to want to research the person, not the property that you're going to be going to meet with to list, right? So how do you do this? Well, you can try to find them on Google, find them on LinkedIn, truepeoplesearch.com. You can, in your prequal, which we're gonna talk about here in a second, ask as many questions as you possibly can to make sure that you're prepared. I see a lot of people that go into listing uh, appointments that have no idea who they're gonna be sitting across from and wondering why it's not this amazing experience because we didn't take the time to prepare. So preparing for the million dollar job interview all starts with gaining the insight that we need to for the client, right? So the three things I think about are what is the motivation? So when you sell, where are you going next? How much do you owe, right? Because I need to prepare accurate net sheets. And I'm going to show you exactly how we do our net sheets here later on to make sure that, let me change this view, there we go to make sure that you know exactly how to do them. Um, so I can prefer, so when I'm on the phone, right? And we're gonna talk about that in the, the pre-qual sheets. I'm basically just trying to keep it conversational while trying to find out everything I possibly can. So when you sell, where are you going next? So I can provide you with the most accurate net sheet. Can you please share with me what you currently owe on the property? And then of course I need to know the condition so I can provide them with an accurate market analysis. So when I'm looking at it, if I'm at a computer, I'm pulling up everything I can. The aerial of the property, I wanna know what it backs up to. I'm pulling up the street view to see if the neighbors have a crack house next to it, right? Or if there's you know, you know, an industrial park or a train behind it or all of these things so I can research it and I can also build rapport because when I'm on the phone with them, if I'm in split screen mode and I'm having those conversations, I can be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you back up to that was beautiful, yada, yada, yada. And they're like, oh my gosh, he really does know my neighborhood. Well, in fact, I'm just using a Google aerial to, to look at the property and research it, right? That's, that's the, not to say it's the secret sauce, but people wanna work with people that they can trust. People wanna work with people that they can say to themselves, he knows about my area and my property. Now, are you gonna know about every neighborhood? No. It's impossible. It's, it's absolutely physically impossible. I don't care if you've been selling real estate for 150 years. It's impossible to know every detail. And some of you think you have, right? Know every detail about every area. It's just not possible. So you're researching while you're talking to the clients to build that rapport. All right. So we're pre-qualifying them. Okay. Now, when we look at this, we want to make sure that we always have our pre-qual lead sheet. So this is our pre-listing qualification sheet. And it works in two functions. It works as a script and it works as an informational piece to make sure that you're getting every single piece of information so you can go in and have a successful appointment. Now, if you're not utilizing this, we offer it on our, our private Facebook page. It's on there right now. We put it on there this morning. Just go Brendan Bartik Coaching Facebook. You'll find it. You can download it, the PDF. There's all kinds of other cool tools and files on there. The reason- yep. And I just want to say, I'm going to add a link to the chat box. So if you guys do want to access it directly to from the group uh, page, go ahead and do so now. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And the reason that this is so important, right, is if you have this set out for you and you know you're going to go call the client before, you know, you get, you get a lead from someone or a referral, you have this set out. It's to give them a better experience and to make sure you don't miss anything, okay? So when we're looking at that, and you can see some of these questions on there. The first question is, are you already working with an agent, right? I see clients that get all the way down this rabbit hole, do all this pre-work, and then find out that the person was going to list with their cousin anyway, and it was a complete waste of time. So people go, well, Brendan, that seems very forward, right? That's not very forward. That's just working smart. So you're going to need to know if they're working with an agent first and foremost. Okay. Now I'm not going to go through every question on here, but I will point out on the sheet, you can see number nine, the disc D I S C for the disc profile. And people go, Brennan, man, you take this neurolinguistic and profiling thing way too serious. And I go, yeah, well, I also sell 300 homes a year. So what do you want me to tell you? Do you want to play at a high level or do you want to list two homes a year? 
This is the difference that the top producers across the country do is they study human behavior. They study psychology. They study neuro-linguistic programming. They study how to read people. They, they, they take it so serious, not because they're trying to make this absorbent amount of money, because they want to enjoy the experience. It's so much more fun to sit across from a client where you're thinking that you're basically doing this game of psychology with them than sitting there completely panicked and paranoid that you're going to screw something up, right? Or you're not going to get the commission or they're going to ask you this question. You're not going to be able to close and you're going to pivot. That's why we want to study these things. So DISC, D-I-S-C with the DISC profile, when I'm on the pre-qualification, I'm trying to find out what is their personality type. Are they a hardcore driver? Are they a, um, a, a very serious engineer and they're very, you know, you know steady and, and it, are, what are they going to care about? Is, is it going to be contract questions, net sheets, all of that? And you do that through asking questions. Now, you can see that there's 29 questions on here. Okay, so 29 questions. You could ask 65. You could ask 110 until you've built a seller profile that you feel comfortable with walking into that scenario, all right? So that's what these questions are designed for. They don't wanna care about you right now and how cool you are and the marketing you do and how awesome your sauce is and all of this. The great agents ask the most questions, okay? Now, when you're looking at it, if you see this, you can customize it. So how did you hear about our team? Obviously, if that's you know an internet lead, they can ask how this came across. Our ISAs use these sheets for when they're setting appointments for another agent on our team. So some of the questions are a little bit different, but you can customize them however you wish for your specific needs. So now that we've pre-qualified them, right? And we know everything on here, some questions that aren't on here that I always kind of think about, right? When I'm looking at, at the, the entire situation is what's important to the seller? What do they care about the most? the reason for the move, the, the reason why they're doing this right now. I really try to dial into why do, why should they care, right? Or why should I care about what their situation is? So make sure that you're trying to get that across. Now, by far and away, the question that I see people skip all the time is number 20, how much do you think your home is worth, right? For some reason, us, you know, with uh, agents, we have a mental block where we are like, we don't wanna ask them the nitty gritty, right? So how much do you think your house is worth? Well, that's what I'm hiring you for, isn't it? No, I completely understand that, John, but let me ask you again, just so I have a baseline, I'm sure you've seen some statistics and things like that. How much do you think it's worth, right? Think about how critical of a question that is, okay? Now, they say 500,000. My immediate next question that I would ask, right, would be, is there a number that you won't go below? Is there a number that's your just drop dead number? Now, they're always going to tell you some, you know, they're going to be like 500. I want 500. My drop dead number is 500. Okay. But at least now I know that when I'm going into these, it's never their drop dead number, first of all, unless there's, unless you get to the other question about how much they owe and you find that out. But that's what I want to know is what am I walking into? Because if they think that their house is worth 600, I'm walking into my CMA and I'm doing 500 and we're a hundred grand apart when we get there. I know at that point, that's not impossible to overcome, but I know exactly the hill I have to climb. I know that I'm going to have to be very, very good at explaining the comparables to make sure we're on the same planet, right? So make sure you use these questions. You could write, you know, 20 more in there. The reason that it's two pages, we could have a hundred questions is it was double-sided and it made life easier, right? We wish we could always fit a thousand questions on these pages, but that's the reason is for ease of use. Perfect. All right. So also, since I'm a professional real estate uh, agent, right, I'm going to need to track my information so I know who I called that day, the conversations that I'm having with people, what was the lead source. So this is a copy of our daily tracking sheet. And this is a personal sheet that just sits on my desk all day long when I'm making my calls. And then when I get stumped on a conversation or, or I'm talking to a lead and I don't necessarily know the right response, I flip it over, it's blank, and I write down what I got smacked with or what you know, issue I had so I can bring it up in my role play sessions or with my coach or whatever it is that I'm trying to work on. 
So this is again, talking about pros, this is the kind of things that they do. And I can be very honest with everyone on here, there's probably 1% of the agent population that tracks their numbers, 1%. And that 1% is selling 95% of all of the homes. 95% of all of the homes. That's a fact, right? Now they might not use this exact sheet. They might use you know, a, a different type of data form, but they're tracking in some form or fashion. So at the end of every quarter, they can know what they did right and what they did wrong. If you're not tracking, you can't improve. So it's highly, highly important to look at that during this process, okay? So again, this is on our private Facebook page, knock yourself out. It's an awesome tool. Again, I give it away for free because I know 1% of the population will use it, right? So enjoy it. All right, let's talk about DISC because it is such a big part of uh, profiling the client that we're talking to. So when we're, we're meeting with them, we know what we're, we're not, not only say what we're walking into, but we know how to really fit their needs. The best agents on the planet are chameleons. Let me say that again. The best real estate agents on the planet are chameleons. They make people feel comfortable. Um, they make people feel, are you hearing that, Anna? Okay, got it. Got it. Thank you. Right, they're making people feel that they're the most important thing in the room. And what makes people feel like that is if you're like them, right? Well, Brendan, I don't wanna be like them. I'm awesome, super awesome. My parents always told me to be an individual. Cool, right? Good for you. Enjoy not selling a lot. Well, I just saw this guy that's called the tattooed realtor and he's completely tattooed and he's doing okay. Cool, be the tattooed realtor. Let me know how that works out, right? I'm, I'm just telling you common sense. People wanna be with people that make them feel comfortable. That's why you have your friend group. That's why your family's very similar. All of those things are making you comfortable. So we have to very quickly be able to assess who I'm going to be meeting with, right? And so we made this pretty fun, right? So if I'm looking at the D driver, right? We're talking about the captain. We're talking about, you know, he or she is boom, 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 boom. You know immediately when you start talking to him because you're like, asshole, this person's an asshole, right? And you really know that really quickly. I'm just kidding. Not all of us are, but most of us are, right? You're like, oh, good, right? I mean, not that all three of these, these people are on here um, are that, but pretty close, right? So when we're looking at that, we're trying to get straight to the point. How, you know, boom, boom. They, they don't want to talk about this for a long time. You know, they're co highly competitive. They, they, they just want the facts. How can I get this done? How quickly? Because you're interrupting me from doing something else I'd rather be doing. Selling my house is an inconvenience. I don't care. I don't want, I don't know you. I don't want to like you. I could care less about you. You're an ends to a mean or a means to an end. Haha, <laughs> even better. Right? So think about that. And I know I'm being overly dramatic right now. There's plenty of super sweet drivers. I get it. Don't get all upset. If you're a driver, and you're like, Hey, I'm not an a-hole. I get it. Good for you. In my experience, most are right. That's all I can tell you. Well, I think when you explain it this way, Brendan, it also makes it much easier. So if you are interacting with a driver kind of personality, it's not personal that they no. want the details, that they want to get down to it. It's just the way they process the information. And I think if you can keep that in the back of your mind, you're going to be able to handle drivers a lot more professionally. Beautifully said. Yeah. You know, I think about it. I just, I don't want, I'd rather pay more and not be bothered, right? A lot of times as a driver. I'm there because it's like, you're taking away from me doing something else. So absolutely. So now let's talk about the high eyes, right? So the high eyes are the influence, the motivator, the usually the best people on earth, right? I don't know how, I don't know if Dolly Parton's the best person on earth, but I bet she'd be fun to hang out with, right? Steve Martin, be super chill. It'd be a good day to hang out with Steve Martin, right? So when you look at those people, and I always, I always talk about this, I think the statistic is something like 85% of all realtors are high eyes, right? 
because you look at it like this, you go, Hey, I'm a high eye. I get into the real estate business. I like people. They like me. We like talking. They're going to love me. And that works for them, right? Because in our business, it does take a lot of talking, a lot of networking, a lot of influencing. So with these people, when you're getting prepared for the listing appointment, you're going to be really dead set on becoming friends with them, right? You're going to be talking about things about charity, school, the PTA. They want to know that they're hiring somebody that cares about them and their care that they put into their home because their home is a reflection of their personality. And if they don't click with you on their personality, they don't want you in their life. I can tell you this in my early um, listing appointments, this was the one I had a problem with because I, I had in my mind where I was trying to be out in 28 minutes, in and out, signed listing agreement in 28 minutes. I kind of hit a wall here with this, this uh, group of clients because they wanted to sit there and chitty chat and talk and talk about their feelings and talk about all this. And I was so programmed that I was just like trying to, you know, get as many listings as humanly possible. I lost a lot of listings early on because I didn't take this part seriously. So I slowed down. I said, hey, here I go. Um, I'm going to get to know this person. And then it became more enjoyable for me as well because I met a lot of cool people. A lot of my clients right now are some of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. And they're still friends and, and you know, past clients and they're awesome. So this is important, right? I spend a lot of time on disc because it's such a majority of our business that's overlooked, right? All right. So steadiness, the high S, right? The supporter, right? When we're looking at that, um, we've got Oprah, right? And she's both, right? She's a high S and a high I. So we want to include her on both so we can talk about that. But Michelle Obama, right? I mean, that's an amazing, you know, again, you know, who would I want to hang out with amazing human being, right? And looking at these types of people that have done amazing things. But when I'm looking at what they care about, right? They want to be very, very cautious and patient. And they really want to make sure that, that they're making the right decision, right? They want to make sure that they didn't leave any stone unturned. They want dependability. What's high important to them is obviously communication, right? They're going to want reports and market reports and know everything that's going on and all that fun stuff. So, so the high S's, again, probably some of the easiest clients to work with because they're usually super chill. You don't get yelled at a lot by these people, right? They're, they're really easy going as long as you stay in front of them. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Sorry. All right. So the high C, right? So the analyst, this is the person where you're going to dive into net sheets, numbers. Uh, they're going to want to know if you're using a, what type of lockbox you're using. They're going to want to know all of these things, right? So they're very analytical. They're very, very, they want a lot of details. They're very systematic, right? When I've worked with these people, these are sometimes where you have some of the issues where they don't care because they're very skeptical because they think all agents are the same. They think everything is the same. And so why do I need to pay a high commission, right? If all you guys do is put it on the MLS and I can do the MLS because I'm smart and I can do these types of things. Why do I need you? So Anna, if you're thinking about it, right, Anna, and I'm going, all right, how do I impress the analyst? It's data. If I walk into a listing presentation and I don't have statistics on why using an agent, uh, you know, for 6% that's absolutely amazing, that does all of these things, produces them more money, then they don't see any of that value there. So they go, hey, everybody's the same. I can get this other guy or gal to do it for 4%. These are the people that use Redfin a lot, right? These are the people, you know, that just don't see the value. So you've got to drive home why you are more impressive. And I'll talk about that here in a second. 
Okay. Well, and this personality type is very similar to a driver type where they can be misunderstood on first glance because they will be a little bit more reserved. Again, skeptical. So when you come in with all of your warmth and your big eye, if that's who you are as a personality, you have to recognize that that their personality is going to be met very differently than if you are greeting an S or, or excuse me, yeah, an S or an I or a D. So just be mindful of, they tend to be a little bit more skeptical even on the introduction. Yeah, well said. I've literally sat at a listing appointment where the, the uh, high uh, C sat there the entire presentation, did not say a word. I literally, all he, all, all he did is goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And, and his wife was super nice, but also very reserved. And it was painful. I literally was crawling out of my skin because I was like, do you not see what I'm doing is impressive. I'm amazing. Acknowledge me. I need your acknowledgement. And it didn't matter to them because they still ended up listing with me. That was just their personality. Right. So I think we get it in our heads. We're like, Hey, this isn't going well. They're not talking to me. doesn't matter that it's not about you. Shut up and talk less. Right. It's about them, right? So, so be very, 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 very careful on knowing this and who you're going to walk into. Now, are there people that are, you know, flat across the board? They're a, a DISC, uh, right? When you're, when you're looking at, are they flat across the board, even in all this? Yes. Of course, there's very rare ones that are like that, but they usually lean somewhere in the mix, all right? So know your clients, increase your lead conversion. Now, a couple of pro tips here. Biggest thing pro tip, and this sounds like common sense, is use their first name all the time, right? So John, Susie, John, Susie, Susie, that's a great question. John, I absolutely appreciate exactly what you're saying there. John, what about this, right? It just bings in their head this little serotonin. It's like, they, he, knows, he cares about me because my name is very important to me. Now, people I know today, well, that seems like common sense, you don't do it. You know how you have to get good at this? You have to practice it when you're not on listing appointments. So you have to practice it with your significant other. You have to practice it with people at work. Really try to get into the habit of anytime you're talking to anybody, just being like, hey, Anna, yada, 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 right? Hey, and just get into that. Then it'll become natural when you're in there uh, because it means a lot to that person. Now, matching and mirroring. So matching and mirroring, when I'm looking at that and I'm in the actual listing appointment, right? And I'm sitting in there. If their elbows are on the table, my elbows are on the table. If they're sitting back with their arms crossed, I'm sitting back with my arms crossed. If they talk super slow, I talk super slow. If they're very loud and annoying, I'm super loud and annoying, right? And it just clicks right on there, very similar. Because again, they want to work with people that are like themselves, that make them feel comfortable, right? And then because of my research, I make it about them. I can name drop certain things because I found out certain things. If I found out that he's a retired colonel, then I'm, I'm, if you don't think that I'm name dropping that I was in the army a thousand times throughout that conversation, done. If I walk in and they're a big Pittsburgh Steelers fan, right? I'm like, oh man, I love Ben Roethlisberger, right? Whatever it is, because that's going to make them feel special, right? And people go, well, Brendan, that doesn't seem authentic. That doesn't, guys, we do it all the time, right? Tell me how authentic your first date was with your significant other. Give me a break. This is a first date. You're not like sitting there and you're like, actually, I cry all the time and I eat a ton of ice cream in the middle of the night. You don't say that on the first date, right? You're like, hey, I'm really outstanding good person and I'm super normal and I don't have all these emotional issues. That's what we do. This is a first date every time, right? It's a first date. So make them feel comfortable, okay? Uh, and, and again, especially on the high eyes, right? They really, like I said, wanna be your friend. All right, now let's get into meat and potatoes. All right, let's prepare for the appointment. Don't forget your pack, your pre-appointment checklist, right? This is very critical. I think about it all the time. And this is where I see agents get screwed up is they're rushing out the door. They've got some black and white CMA, you know, printed off of a, a printer that's running out of ink. They're frantic, all of this. Let's be very careful to just run down the checklist. So 
For every successful listing appointment, you need to have your CMA, okay? Duh, comparative market analysis. Now, I get a lot of questions. People go, well, Brendan, I was taught to do a two appointment listing appointment where I'm supposed to go to the house, look at everything, and then do the CMA. How can I do a CMA if I don't see the house? You will lose. Let me just explain this very carefully. Whoever taught you that, tell them to call me. I will tell them they're wrong. Here's how I know this. Because I take tons of listings from people that were doing the two appointment listing. Because you're coming back waiting for your second time. I've already got them signed and I'm calling you saying, hey, you know, John and Susie told me that they really appreciated meeting you, but that they've decided to list with me. So I wish you the best of luck. And if you have a buyer, I'd love for them to come by and see the home. I've made that call thousands of times, right? Because someone was doing a two appointment. So you do the CMA ahead of time because you have more than enough information at your fingertips to be able to walk into that appointment prepared to have an educated conversation about where to price it so the home will sell. But Brendan, what if I walk in and it has golden floors and there's these amazing murals of Olive Garden in there and it's just absolutely beautiful? Okay, we can adjust, right? We can adjust. Again, we're not doing an appraisal. We're doing a comparative market analysis. What would the buyers be willing to pay for this property? Not what is it going to appraise for? That's a big difference. We aren't appraisers. We're finding out what a buyer would be willing to pay for, okay? So you gotta have your CMA, right? I'm gonna talk about the components of a successful CMA. We also teach an entire another class called the most powerful CMA on earth, CMA on earth. And we go through the CMA step by step by step. This is not a CMA class. This is list like a boss class, all right? So listing presentation. When I say listing presentation, this is your value package to the client, right? This is your beautiful, let me show you a copy here. This is your beautiful marketing material that, that you're going to present to them that is going to show why you're of value, right? So your listing presentation, okay? High gloss, absolutely beautiful, amazing, why you, you know, who you, you know, the reason, all the great things you do, all of that, right? So you've got your listing presentation, okay? Sample marketing, right? So I'm gonna wanna have sample marketing so I can show them. Now be very careful on this when I say the word sample. You see this house? I didn't sell this house. This is a Photoshop house, right? That's very beautiful, right? This stands up when I'm sitting in front of them and I go, look, you're gonna have the same thing here. We have different levels for different price points, okay? I also have sample marketing. And if you, if you can kind of see here, it says your home, your neighborhood. They don't care if you've never sold a house before. They care about what's the marketing you're gonna produce for them, right? A lot of agents get caught up in that I need this, that, or the other. You just need a good sample. Now, pro tip, you're gonna want a sample for different things. So luxury, general single family, condo, right? Like condo, you know, in a condo building and then townhome, right? So I have a different version for each. So they know that I specialize in each version, okay? So to get these from Express Docs or whatever company you're using, I mean, it costs to get a couple samples, 50 bucks, right? 50 bucks. But I have those on file and they're sitting there in my little filing cabinet. Oh, appointment for this. Boom, let's pull that and I'm out. And then your just listed postcard. So you're gonna have a sample. If you offer just listed cards as part, of your, as part of your presentation, right? You're gonna have a sample card that shows what you're gonna to send to the entire neighborhood. Again, if you haven't sold a lot of properties, use a beautiful stock property to use as your sample, right? So they can see the quality of what you're gonna do for their home, okay? Estimated net sheets. You have to have estimated net sheets because again, if you walk in there and you thought that you were talking to a high I and it happens to be a really high S and a high C, they're gonna wanna go through those net numbers right there, right? So you gotta make sure that you're ready to do that. We're gonna go through net sheets here in a second, so I'll show you those. Listing agreement, already completely filled out with everything highlighted exactly where you need to have them sign and any things that you wanna point out to them. So when I'm doing my listing agreement, names are already filled in, everything's already done, commissions done, all of this is done, my additional provisions, which I'll show you here in a moment, are done. And everything's highlighted on what I wanna draw their attention to that I think is important per page. So I can, again, 
boom, 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 done, sign here. There's a little highlight and an X where they need to put their name, put the pen down and sit there and shut up. All right, that's it. So we'll talk about that here in closing techniques in a moment. I'm gonna teach you what we call our transition to close technique, which is a very simple way of getting the, the uh, client to move forward with signatures without you ever having to feel pushy or salesy or anything. And it works and I love it and you're gonna like it. I'm gonna show you here in a second. All right, uh, listing presentation folder. You need to carry all this stuff in something beautiful, right? I always recommend white. I've seen others use um, uh, different colors. The other colors seem to get very fingerprinty. Pro tip, right? People are like, gosh, Brendan, that's what you're carrying about? Is like there's fingertips? Yes, that's the stuff I care about, right? That's the stuff. It's all presentation, right? So make sure what you're doing, because you're sitting there already, you know, and you're sweaty and you're nervous and, you know, you're, you're, you're all clammy. It's going to get all weird if you have fingerprints all over the presentation material. Question that I get all the time, Anna, right? And, and I know somebody out there is thinking it right now. Why don't you use an iPad, right? Why don't you use an iPad? Why don't you use a, uh, your laptop or any of those types of things? Because if for some reason I'm not able to secure the listing right there, they have all of this material. The other guy or gal that was competing against me took all their material with them and is now gone. So now they only have Brendan who has all this amazing stuff or Samantha who showed us this cool presentation on her laptop, but I already forgot who she is because she just has this janky business card with her and a picture of her dog, right? That's it, cool? So you I think wanna... the difference, sorry to interrupt, I was just no. going to say, I think the biggest difference is, is the presentation with a folder, something that they can hold on to, it makes it about them, the client, and the iPod, and the iPad makes it about you and looking how cool you are. And that is the difference in shifting between how do I make this about them always and forever versus how do I make myself feel good about what I'm doing? And we have to start to shift that mindset a little bit. Yeah, excellent. And, and, and well said there. And, Again, senses, right? Sound, touch, tangible, all of these things make a difference. Now, my entire listing package probably cost me, I don't know, we, and I'll show you all this we, you know, later on, but I, I would say 10 to $12 for all the printouts, everything completely done. Would you spend 12 to $15 for 10,000? If the answer is not yes, then, then we're, we're talking about crazy things here, right? Um, so, so again, listening agreement done, presentation folder, directions to the property. I still print out directions every time. I know we have GPS, I know we have our phone. I've gotten screwed a number of times where the GPS was wrong. It was a new construction development. I thought I was there and I was late. And if you're late, enjoy the hate, right? If you're late, enjoy the hate. No matter what, they are going to hate you. They won't say it to your face. They're like, oh, it's totally fine. You were 10 minutes late then they're already made a decision not to go with you because of that lack of professionalism, right? So you've got to make sure you can be there on time. We're going to talk about that here in a, section, uh, in a second. So know your list price going in. You've done your market analysis. You know what number this house is going to sell at, right? I, I hear people go all the time, well, Brendan, when I get in there, I don't know. And what do you think? What do you think, Brendan? What do you think? Here's the easiest question. What would cause the home to sell in 72 hours. What price would cause the home to sell in 72 hours? That's your price. You list it on Friday, by Monday morning, you should have multiple offers. But Brendan, I, my role in this is to get my, my sellers the absolute highest price. So I need to hedge this magical number and put this a fake number on it that hopefully they'll get. And when they don't, they'll, I'll have to beat them up on price reductions and then they'll end up hating me. Doesn't make any sense. If you come to our, our CMA class, you'll learn how to find out exactly what that number should be because there is a process to it, but what's the price that's gonna cause it to sell in 72 hours? You always wanna be a hero with the client, have multiple offers. The, the market's gonna set the price for the home anyway, right? So if you're gonna have a bidding war and it's gonna get them all this, you're not this ninja pricing person where it's like, well, I don't know if I listed at 469.5 versus 475, that's going to, no, 72 hours, 72 hours. All right. And then have a pocket calculator. And I know Anna loves this one. She's like, Brennan, why a pocket calculator? 
right? Because you don't want to pull out your phone that has your rainbow bright sprinkles on it, on your, your cover of your phone to go over net sheet calculator numbers, especially if you're dealing with a high D or somebody else. The high I might like it, right? And then you're trying to, you know, then you're getting calls and you're getting text pictures from your friends and you're trying to show them your calculator. Just have a little pocket calculator that you keep in your purse or in your jacket, right? That you can just pull out. It just flips and pops up open and they're going to go, this person's a serious business person because they're not using their phone. And some of your phones are gross. I've seen them too. They're gross. So it's all a presentation. It's all a show. And if you have your phone out, what I've learned from watching other people do it, uh, you know, when I've, when I've been on uh, appointments with them, they'll have it out and it's a distraction. I want to be giving my sole attention to my clients. I've told people a lot of times, leave your phone in the car, right? You don't need it. You don't need it. So have a pocket calculator, right? All right. So don't forget, you got your pack. You're ready to go off to your, your listing appointment. Campers, we're ready to rock and roll, right? So now let's talk about our CMA. What's included in our detailed CMA? Two to three actives, two to three under contracts, four to six solds, a map page, right? So when we're looking at the map page, we need to make sure that when we're talking to the client, right, it's going to be professionally bound like this, right? My beautiful CMA that has my beautiful logo on it, has my, my back cover on it that makes me look like a, an actual professional, right? I take the extra time to bind this and it looks super smart. And we always start out with our stats, right? So we're going to start out with stat page, which is from, we use Altos, but you can use any stats that you want. Because when I'm doing the CMA, I'm taking them through the overall market to the finish line, which is going to be my intelligent pricing and timing pages, which I'll show you here in a moment, right? But this is the reason we do it. Now, the other question I get is, well, Brendan, do you use, you know, cloud CMA? Do you utilize all of this crazy stuff? No, I don't. I like using it directly from the CMA, right? Um, to make sure, you know, with the map and all of this, that it's very easy to understand. This is, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be presenting this to try to get to a finish line, which is the price that's gonna cause the home to sell in 72 hours. That's the whole reason of the CMA is designed. Okay, so then intelligent pricing and timing sheet. All right, so let's talk about that. The two important pages of your CMA, I'll go into here in a moment, is gonna be your intelligent pricing and timing. Now, pre-appointment pro tips. One of the things we didn't talk about was the pre-listing package, okay? So if I'm sending the pre-listing package, all I'm sending them is a folder, the sample marketing with the brochure and the postcard, and my listing, what we call our marketing plan of action, right? My marketing plan of action with a nice handwritten note that says, I look forward to meeting you Tuesday at whatever. Now, if your appointment's the same day, that's tough to do. We courier our listing appointments, so we pay 20 bucks to have a courier take them and hand deliver them because it's more impressive. That's the only reason we do it. It's just more impressive, okay? So pre-listing package. Now they know that I'm impressive. Now they know that they can look through this stuff. And when I get there, it's going to make my appointment that much faster, okay? Now calendar invite, have a backup plan for virtual meeting, okay? If something unfortunately happens and now you can't go, then we need to have that backup plan. So that would be an email saying, hey, if you don't feel comfortable me coming there in person, I have an entire rundown of how we can do this virtually via Zoom. And you do everything we're doing now, except all of those items we talked about um, are either pre-sent to them or we have them in a digital, what we call issue link that looks like a digital brochure that I send to them ahead of time for them to review before our, our virtual listing appointment. That's the only difference. There's not much difference from in-person versus virtual. It's just how comfortable is the client. I would always rather get in front of them as a human being, if I can, than having to do it virtually at, a, at all cost. All right. So now we're at, we're, uh, or step three, we're getting ready to be at the appointment. Okay. So we're getting ready. Uh, and here's a lot of where I see a lot of things go sideways. Okay. No matter what you need to arrive in the neighborhood at least. And when I say at least 30 minutes early, if you're a newer agent and, and you, you're like, Hey, I can't believe I actually got this appointment. I'm super excited. Wow. I need to go knock it out. 
get in the neighborhood as early as possible. Drive it the night before if, you, if you're not having an appointment that same day. Find out everything you can, where the parks are, where the hiking trails are, where the um, super target is, where the grocery store is, where the fitness centers are, all of that. So you can bring those up during your appointment. So again, they know that you are a, a neighborhood expert and understand their neighborhood. I want somebody that knows my neighborhood. Well, how do you know that if you don't research it? Does it make sense to list with you because you live in their neighbor, or uh, the other agent because they live in their neighborhood? Or does it make sense to list with you? How do you create that separation, right? It's the value that you bring, okay? The, the neighborhood expert is very different than you and for value of what you bring, okay? All right, and the other thing I would say is, do you really think the buyer for the home is gonna come from the neighborhood? So do you want me to mark to just your neighbors or to the entire world? What would you prefer? Okay. All right. At the absolute latest, you're parked in front of the house 15 minutes early. Do not park in the driveway ever, 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 ever. Right. And I'll, I'll explain a couple of reasons why. Number one, it's not your house. Number two, when we're, when we're looking at this after the appointment, there's some things that we need to do as far as once we take the listing where you don't want your car in the driveway. Number three, unless you have a very, very nice car, they're going to be judging you on what car you drive when they walk out, right? So again, borrow your car. If you don't have a nice car, take an Uber. We just had one of our agents literally a few months ago list because of an Uber because uh, his car broke down that morning. What I don't care whatever it is, make sure, especially if you have a hoopty car, that it's parked down the street, right? You, they don't, don't even see it, okay? Next thing, the reason we're there early is we're going to visualize the sellers signing the contract. So I'm sitting there, I'm parked a little bit down from their house. I'm running through my entire presentation. My eyes are closed, just like a pro athlete. I'm imagining the entire process. Hi, cheesy smile at door, ha ha, you know, little joke, take off my shoes, go down and sit in, or sit down in the living room, take a tour of the house after I have established their goals, come back to the kitchen table, have them both sitting across from me if there's two different, you know, if it's a husband and wife or husband, husband or wife, wife, whatever it is. They're sitting across from me, uh, going through the market analysis, visualizing me, uh, having them sign, giving me the key to the lockbox, me putting the lockbox on the door, me taking a picture with my phone before I leave, me getting in the car, air high-fiving myself, and driving off because I just made 10 grand. That's what I'm visualizing, is that entire process of success, okay? And that's a big deal. That's a big deal because it builds your confidence, right? And confidence is everything when we come to this process, okay? Make sure you've got fresh breath. That should be a no-brainer. If you just went to Olive Garden at lunch and had the extra garlic Alfredo, that's going to be gross when you're sitting across from that person, okay? <clears throat> now, here's another pro tip. Knock on the door 10 minutes early. If you're listing appointments at 2 p.m., you're knocking on the door at 1.50, okay? The reason is, is this is all psychology. I want to catch them off guard instead of them waiting to the minute for me to show up, right? Because if I'm a high D, if you're not 10 minutes early, you're five minutes late. And I'm going, is this jerk off going to show up or what? Is he here yet? Is, are they going to even show up today? And then I'm already irritated. So if I catch them 10 minutes early, they're scrambling around. They're trying to, you know, you know, put their underwear away and their socks and all this stuff. And they're trying to get the hustle to bustle. And I catch them. They're like, oh, you're a little bit early. And you're like, oh, am I? Weird. Right? Now I've taken control from the start of that scenario. So now I can walk in and I can be in that, not to say power position, but they're not waiting on me. Cool. All right. So they open the door. No matter what, for the history of your life, you will always take your shoes off, right? You'll always not only offer, but they're going to say, no, 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 it's totally fine. You're still going to take your shoes off unless, again, it's a sketchy house and there's, you know, syringes everywhere, which I've walked into, and it's a mess, then leave your shoes on for safety reasons, okay? But you're taking your shoes off for two reasons. One, it's a sign of respect, that you respect their home that much, that you're doing this, or I've seen other agents do this. You can bring the little booty covers and put booties on, and you can do that if your feet smell or you have bad sock game or whatever it is, right? So if you just want to do booties, 
But the reason I do it, and here's the cheesy line, hey, hey, you know, John, I appreciate that. You know what? I just want to protect the asset because I want to make sure that we're taking care of your home so we can get you the highest price possible. Super cheesy. It works, right? Because the other guy or gal didn't say that. The other guy or gal walked in with snow on their feet and trampled through their house and they didn't care. Okay. So make sure you don't have runs in your pantyhose. Make sure you have matching socks. Make sure your socks don't have weird, you know, I've seen SpongeBob SquarePants socks. Do I want to work with somebody that has SpongeBob SquarePants socks? Maybe if I love SpongeBob SquarePants, but generally no, I'd like to have a professional. Okay. Think about every detail. Every detail is important, all right? Now, when you open the door, the first thing they're gonna ask you is, well, let me take you through and show you the house. You stop right there and you say, hey, Susie, I, I definitely can't wait to see the entire house, but I'd like to sit down for a moment and just confirm your goals and go back through and make sure that I completely understand everything that's going on, uh, and then we can take a look at the house. So would you mind if we just sat down here in the living room for, the, for a moment? You always want to do the initial consultation in the living room because that's the safe spot, right? That's where they feel comfortable. You don't want to do it in the kitchen because again, kitchens where usually business happens. Uh, this is where you're going to take them anyway. Once you have documents being signed, because you need to sit across from a table. So I sit down on the couch, you know, matching and mimicking them. If their legs are crossed, my legs are crossed. If they have one arm up, I'm trying to sit with one arm. Now, if you, you're not in a chair like that, don't hold your arm up like a moron, right? But you're doing the best you can to match and mimic them, to make them feel comfortable as if I was over there having a glass of wine and having a book club, okay? And the first question I'm going to ask, and this should be the question you always ask, so John, Susie, again, thank you. I, you know, I, I've got all my notes here from when we talked a few days ago or this morning or whenever it was. So can you tell me, when was the last time you sold a home? That's the question. When was the last time you sold a home? They're either going to say never, right? And they say, oh my gosh, this is our first time. Well, this is your first time. I happen to specialize in first time home sellers. Oh my gosh. Well, that's super exciting. I'm going to take you through this step by step by step. Okay. If they've sold a home, they're going to be like, yeah, we sold a home about four years ago prior to us moving here. Great. Well, tell me about that experience. Well, it was great. It was horrible. It was this, it was that, it was okay. That's wonderful. Well, Susie, was there anything you liked? that that agent did really well? Well, yeah, they did these awesome open houses that were really, really great, da 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 Okay, don't say that you do open, great open houses right then, just shut up, you're writing your notes, right? You're just wait, you're getting, you're getting all the details that you're gonna leverage later on in your presentation, right? I'm finding out what they care about and what was important to them. If it was a terrible experience, right? They're gonna be like, she listed the house and then never called us ever again, all right. I'm so sorry to hear that. That's terrible. I don't down her. I don't say that I'm super great at communication. You're just taking your notes. Okay. All right. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. That's frustrating, right? All right. Now I've got all of this. Now you can ask him some more questions. Maybe you didn't get the best prequal done when you were on the phone. You can ask him all of these things, right? The next question that I always ask is if it was the perfect situation, when would you like to have the home sold? And when would you like to be in your new home? That's it. If it was the perfect situation, when would you like the home sold? When would you like to be in your new home? So those are the two questions. From there, you could ask a lot more. You could, you know, do whatever, but those are the two that you're going to need. Now, here is the most important part of this initial consultation, right? Is now setting the expectation of what's going to happen next. Okay. So we've reviewed their goals. So now, well, you know what, Susie, John, thank you so much. All of that really makes a lot of sense to me. I'm super excited for the both of you to get to North Dakota as soon as possible. What I'd like to do now is I'd like you to take me through your home. I'd like to start on the main level first. After that, I would like to go upstairs. After that, I'd like you to take me through the basement. After we go through the basement, and again, if, if, if applicable, of course, right, if applicable, then after that, I'd like to put my shoes back on. I'd like to do a full 360 of the exterior, again, if applicable, right? If it's a single family home. And then after that, I'd like to come back in. We'll sit down at the kitchen table because I really need some good lighting and I have a lot of information I want to go over with you today. Um, and we'll sit back down. 
at, once we sit down, uh, Susie and John, I'm gonna take you through the detailed market analysis so we can talk about how I can get you the highest price possible for your home. We're gonna go through estimated net sheets so you'll know exactly what you're walking away with after it's all said and done. And then lastly, I'm going to explain to you exactly what I do to get my clients the highest price possible, right? So any questions before we look at the home? Setting the expectation is so important because if they were interviewing other people, they just sat through some babbling weirdos presentation that was like blah, 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 all over the place. And it didn't look like they do this every single day. If you walk into a doctor's office, is there usually a process? Same thing. If you walk into any place that's a really true professional, there's a process. You just don't walk in and the doctor's sitting there and you're like, what's up doc? High five them. And then you're like, oh, all right, you want to stick that in my, okay, well, let's go ahead and do that first, I guess. Right? No, you don't do that. There's a process before these things happen and there's an expectation that's set. Okay. So it's very important to set the expectation. Cool. So now one of the questions, and I know Anna was, was just about to interrupt me. She, one of the question is why do the full 360 of the exterior, right? Because the other guy or gal didn't. That is the big, big reason. You take that extra time and you're writing notes and you're looking at the roof and you're looking at the shingles and you're looking at the little small crack on the exterior. You're writing all these notes, right? Do they need to paint this? Do they need to do that? Is there dog poo everywhere? Is there this, is there that, right? The other agent didn't. The other agent got to the back porch, looked around goes, all right, yeah, great, looks great, great, neat, yeah, that walks right off, goes back in. And especially for the, the sellers that have put their heart and soul into the landscaping. They wanna tell you every tree and what fruit it produces. If I'm a seller, do I care about the actual house all that much? I care about the memories when we planted that first pear tree and it provided us, you know, you know our family did such and such, or this, or that. Or remember that weekend that we, we, we uh, replanted the entire trees and look how much beautiful it is. That's what they care about. So remember what I, I said earlier. It's about yeah, sorry. I was just going to say this really kind of struck me in the way of not only is setting the expectations about being careful with your client and by careful, I mean, full of care for them and their property. It's also about due diligence, right? The property you don't take the 360 on is inevitably the property that's going to give you a headache because you didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the other thing is, yes, be careful with your client, but also be aware of everything that could possibly come up. It's better to know and take note then than be blindsided by it later on in the process. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want any surprises in this, right? And I mean, that's exactly it. You don't want any surprises. Yep. So now if it's a condo building, right, I have them. And again, with condos, I have them show me every single part of the building, right? Every amenity, the, the, the coin of operated laundry, where their parking space is, exactly. It takes a long time, but those are the benefits. And a lot of times I've sold these buildings 10 times over and I know where they're at, but the seller loves taking you through. That's about them, right? The, the indoor pool that smells gross, that's empty half the, half the year because they don't ever can keep it right. He's like, we've got a pool. I'm like, that looks disgusting. Awesome. Never, no one's ever going to go in there, but I'm glad it smells in here. Right. But they care about it because it's one of the reasons they decided to buy that unit. All right. If it has a rooftop deck, I'd love to see it. If it has a fitness center, that's the size of a closet. Oh my gosh. How great that you can do exactly nothing in this fitness center. That's awesome. I'm just kidding. Right. Got to have fun with this. Okay. But you're taking detailed notes the entire time, which is going to make it easier to list it too, because you're going to have to, you know, do this entire profile when you're there. All right. Um, so we've now seen everything. We're sitting back down at the kitchen table. You might be asking me, Brendan, what if the unit's vacant? Right? Great question. Right? If the unit is vacant, you make the best of this, the situation you have. I always make this joke. I've done it on car hoods. I've done it on fireplaces. I've done it on the kitchen counter. I've done it on ledges, right? Wherever you can do it, right? 
it's going to be okay. You can just do the best that you can do so you can give them the presentation, right? You still want to present to them somewhere. I've, I've literally, well, I'll just sit down on the floor, right? Like if it comes to it, right? And I'm, I'm in a, a lot of times a three piece suit. So it's whatever it takes, because that's what the other person's not going to do. Do what others want to have what others want. Right? But Brendan, I just want to be well balanced and I want to have this super good life. Great. Then don't do this stuff and don't make a lot of money. Right? Don't send your kids to a good school. Cool. Do whatever you want. Right? But if you want to be a top professional, this is what they do. Okay? All right. So now I'm sitting at the kitchen table. This is very important piece right now. I want them both directly across from me. Okay. Now, if I can have them catty cornered, that's okay. It's not as preferable. I like to have them both across from me because when I'm presenting information, one of the skills that we train on is I read upside down. So if I'm presenting information like this, I'm setting it on the table, I'm reading upside down because it's about them, right? So in the CMA, I have it highlighted very specifically to draw my attention to certain things. How awkward is it? Think about it, you're on a presentation and you don't know these people more than 10 minutes and you're snuggling up next to them because you're trying to share information being like, yeah, do you see these comps here? Oh, and what, wait, what does the price per square foot have? And some of you, you know, are wearing, you know, you, you can't see five feet in front of you. So you've got, you know, massive glasses on, you're trying to read the information. You've got to come in and make sure that you're prepped to make this a display, right? It's a presentation at all cost. So everything is upside down across from me, okay? Um, and then again, the reason we don't want to go back to the living room, it's hard to do a listing presentation off a coffee table or your kneecap. I've done it, right? I've done it because I've been in hoarders houses and you can't even find the kitchen table. And there's literally like a cat eating, you know, another cat off of it, right? So I've had to do it in the living room. Yeah, oh, the stuff I've seen will make you, you ooh, ooh. anyway, but, but, Right. So if at all possible, uh, a funny story, I was also sitting at a kitchen table and it had a big um, uh, tablecloth over it and I'm sitting there. And again, I'm in a brand new suit. I just bought this thing like three days, custom, custom tailored. It was, it was nice. All of a sudden I feel something bite into my calf. Right. So there's a feral cat underneath the dining room table, bites me, goes crazy, goes bites me carves me up. I punt this thing underneath the table because I thought I was literally being attacked by God knows what. Rips a hole. I'm bleeding everywhere, right? In my pants. Worst thing, they still listed with somebody else. Didn't, didn't offer for me to fix my dry cleaning. Are didn't, you kidding? I swear to you, to this day, I was so mad. And since it was a custom suit, I couldn't get the pants to rematch the, the, the custom, you know, issues, right? It was like, yeah, what was me? Right. But it was just the whole suit was ruined is the point of the story. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to walk into. Right. So always look under the tablecloth before sitting down. It's my other rule. OK. Um, but uh, so and then lastly, do not leave without signatures ever. Right. I'm in there and I'm literally going, you're going to have to pry my dead body out of this chair before I don't have signatures because I know there, there's some amazing agent right behind me that's going to come in and work harder to get them than I did, and I'm done. And then I'm getting that phone call, right? So we're going to talk about some techniques on how to do that and not sound like a scumbag. And, and that is a very, very sensitive subject on how to do this and not make yourself feel awkward and also not make them feel awkward. So those are the 10 big things to make sure that you're going to close, right? <clears throat> so as we know, closing comes from pure confidence, right? If you look back and again, uh, to anything that you've ever experienced, uh, maybe you were dating, maybe you were at the, your first school dance, right? That fear of you being like, I'm going to go talk to April is terrifying, right? How do you get up that confidence to go and do this? Well, the answer is quite simply practice, right? The more you practice this and visualize it in your head, the more you go to role play, the more that you practice with your, your significant other, your grandma, your, 
I used to sit there and make everyone on earth I knew in my family sit through listing presentations with me so I could get real time practice. And to the point where they really were starting to hate me, they were like, I'm not going to do this again. I'm like, all right, one more time, one more time. Did you like this better? Did you like that better? All right? Can you use this accent? Can you also be from New York? And can you hate everything about everything, right? I was going to make a political joke, but it's a weird sensitive time right now. So, right, but I'm role playing these scenarios to make sure that I'm ready to rock. Again, when I went back to that million dollar mindset, when I say that it's worth a million dollars, I have clients to this day that have referred to me 20, 25 clients that have sold with me three or four times that have bought multiple investment properties with me. And it was always the weird ones where it was like a land listing. It was like a hundred thousand dollar land listing. And I'm like, oh, the hundred thousand dollar land listing, this is going to be a real fun one, right? That client ended up being a million dollar client. So you never know what you're walking into. You never know. So your preparation has to be the same. So I get questions all the time. Well, Brendan, do you wear a suit if you're going to list a $100,000, you know, you know, house in Commerce City or wherever, right? Um, and the answer is yes, right? I've been in a three-piece suit sitting on a flipped over bucket and going through a listing presentation. And it wasn't because the guy moved out, he just didn't have furniture and he sat on buckets. That's it, right? I give him the same respect as I would anyone else, period, end of story. Because again, it gives me that confidence. When I would put on that suit, right? And my tie is sharp and I'm doing all of this. I've taken so many listings from clients that said, it's because you were the only one that dressed professional. That's why we went with you. It didn't have anything to do with anything else. And you know who loves this the most? Little old men and little old ladies. They love them a sharp dressed man or woman, right? They love it because it's a sign of respect. It was the fact that I took the time to do that and put it on instead of showing up in my polo shirt that says XYZ real estate company with a donut stain on it, right? They're judging every single Thing about you because you're interviewing for a job, right? So come and get that confidence, right? You got to practice to get that confidence. Now, you're confident. We're talking about the CMA. Two of the biggest pages that I utilize to leverage my CMA are my intelligent pricing sheet and my intelligent timing sheet, okay? Now, we include these in our, our um, my complete listing system course. Uh, that Anna is going to uh, provide a link to. We give you all of these tools to make sure that you can have success with it. But basically, this is the sheet that helps me with pricing. So I've gone through my comps, I've gone through my market analysis, and they say to me, Brendan, everything you say sounds awesome, but we want to list it high and come down later. We want to list it at 550. We know the comps say 500, but we want to list it 550. So I go to this sheet in my CMA. It's the last two pages of my CMA. And again, I'm, I'm in front of them reading upside down. And I go, okay, well, let me just talk to you about the problem with that. If we price it at 550, we're gonna be at about 10 to 15% over market value, which means we're only gonna be attracting 30 or 10 to 30% of the buyer pool. Now, John, Susie, you do wanna get the most money possible, correct? They have to say yes, right? Yes, because they, they definitely want to get the most money possible. That's why we want to, we don't want to be at the top of the pyramid, and I always draw on it, and we don't want to be at the bottom, right? We want to be right in that sweet market value spot so you can be turning offers down instead of not receiving any offers at all. So you can be turning down offers instead of not receiving any offers at all. Well, Brendan, that all sounds fine to me, but why don't we just wait? Right, right, can we just price it high and come down later, right? Well, then I go to my second page. The problem with that is the most activity we're going to have on your property is going to be in the first three weeks, right? And in this market, it's really like the first three days. And I always say that. So after that, after the fourth, fifth, sixth week, if we are not under contract, then what people do, and I draw on this page, Right at week seven, I draw a little hump. If we have to do a price adjustment, 
we'll get a little bit more excitement, but we'll never get back to the excitement of those first three days or three weeks. So do you see how that's a problem if we wait? Then you're gonna be getting low ball offers or no offers at all. I don't want you to get beat up on price, John. I want you to get the most money possible. So that's why we want to price it at the sweet spot of market value. So you're in the driver's seat. Do you want to be in the driver's seat or do you want the buyers to be in the driver's seat? Okay. If you practiced only two sheets for the next year, it would be these two sheets. It will help you in every conversation about pricing on earth. They're very simple, but the way that you leverage them and utilize them are very delicate. Okay. Now, what if they just go, you know what, Brendan, I don't care about any of that. I, I need, here's my favorite objection, I need 550. Okay, I completely understand that you feel that you need 550 to sell this home. John, Susie, tell me how to get there. The last comparable in your neighborhood, the highest one that's ever sold, that was comparable, sold for 489,000. You wanna list yours at 550,000. How do I explain to the buyers the difference in that gap? Okay. You're always on their side. Go ahead, Anna. Now, Brendan, I, I have a question. As we're talking about pricing, if the client is coming back and saying, yeah, but the <clears throat> Zestimate says 550. Absolutely. And, and, and I completely understand the Zestimate, but let me explain what that is. All the Zestimate is, is a computerized algorithm. Has Zillow been inside your house? No. Okay, yeah, they haven't, right? <laughs> so how could they possibly understand what the local real estate market is and how much your home is worth? Again, these three closed comps that sold in the last six months sold for X, Y, and Z. So you would imagine that that would help you determine market value. And you know what, think about this. Let, let's just say that we were going to look for a car, right? Mm -hmm. If we were going to look for a car and we went to a Honda dealership and there was a Mercedes, a brand new Mercedes in that Honda dealership, would you expect you to pay extra for that Mercedes, even though it's a, with a bunch of other Hondas? Yeah, yeah, I would. Exactly right. <laughs> but when you look at all the Hondas, you would feel that they'd all be pretty similar in pricing, correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. That's how we determine market value. It's the same concept, right? So you just have to bring the client through logic on, on pricing, all right? Now, I'm gonna to try to stay on time here. So estimated net sheets, all right? Here's another secret sauce. You want some secret barbecue sauce. Estimated net sheets is everything, all right? So if you're looking at this, these are the customized ones that we utilize. I use a, a technique called a variable commission structure. So four and a half, five, and 6%. So again, there, this is a very easy technique to reduce any price adjustment question or uh, commission adjustment questions that you might get. So here's how you pitch it, right? So John, Susie, so first of all, when I have this in my portfolio, I always pull out the four and a half percent sheet first, the one on the right. It's already pre-filled pre out. All the numbers are written on there, right? Everything's ready to go for what I feel their house should, should uh, sell for. Now, I always go lower. So if you look at this sheet, sales price, if I thought their house was worth 500, my sales price number would be 475. Why do you think that is? Well, it's because I can always go up, I can't go down. So if I do it at 475, I walk in there, how easy it is for me to line through that number Put it to 500 because they have beautiful linoleum or an amazing, you know, new dishwasher that they got. And I can take it to that number. Do you see what I'm saying? So now they're feeling like they're validated and I'm going through my estimated net sheets. So here's how that conversation goes. So John, if you're looking at it, so John, Susie, so here's the, the deal. So at a sales price of 500,000, and again, again, when I walked in just based on the comps, I really thought this was gonna be 475, but based on everything you've done, 500 is definitely that number. At 500,000, if myself or any member of my organization represents the buyer, the total commission is reduced all the way down 
to four and a half percent. Okay. Now, based on that, I already did an estimated title policy before I arrived here, and your mortgage balance, as you told me on the phone, was two hundred thousand dollars. So your net estimated proceeds are X, Y, Z. Now, again, the proceeds are already written in there before I go in there. And again, if I'm making a $15,000 adjustment, I'm just subtracting 15,000 or adding 15,000. I'm making that quick adjustment on the fly. And this is a worksheet. That's all this is. Now, you can have other potential costs, prorated taxes, HOA dues. But again, John, Susie, this is just an estimated net sheet. This isn't a to the penny, but from here, you can pretty much understand what you're walking away with, correct? And they always go, yes. Excellent. Now, if for some random reason, we're not able to sell it in-house and you purchase your next property through us, we have a 5% net sheet uh, or we have a 5% offering. So if I know, and you are gonna buy through us, correct, John? Susie, yeah, absolutely, okay. So on my other sheet that says 6%, I line that out, write 5% on it, because I know that the 6% is never even going to be an issue. And they love, people love seeing things get crossed out. They're like, ooh, deal, deal. Anytime you cross things out, they are thinking deal, deal, right? And then I'm redoing my math with my pocket calculator, and I'm going, here you go. Now, if they're moving to Alaska, so John, it sounds like, you know, you're not going to be purchasing through us. And for some random reason, if you move to Alaska and we're not able to sell the property in-house, then it's the standard 6% commission. And you'd be walking away at whatever numbers in that net, net proceed estimate box. Okay? These are delicate conversations. This is where you'll win or lose a listing is an estimated net sheets. I've walked into to properties after an agent's been there and they literally have an estimated net sheet that is so terrifying that has every little thing on earth on it. And it looks like they, you got this price and then there was this, 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 the courier fee, the, the title company's examination. There was stuff on, on these net sheets that I didn't even know was a thing in real estate. I honestly didn't realize there were this many fees. You're explaining to them that this is estimated. If they'd like a to the penny spreadsheet, the title company will provide one to them. Think about that verbiage. You don't want to get into nickel and dime when you're sitting in front of the client. You want to give them an estimate. Okay, very important. Now, Brendan, on those, just before we kind of move on, um, our friend Tyson asked a question. Do you put the actual dollar figure of the commissions on these? Do you put the, no, good question. Notice how that's not there? Good, Tyler, was that, Tyler, that's the smartest Tyson. question I've yeah. heard on this presentation probably in five years, right? That was a beautiful observation because it doesn't matter. It's what their net proceeds are that they're walking away with that they care about. Do I want to write on there that I'm making 29 G's? No, no, I don't want to write on there. That is, that is a scary number to talk about. That was a great question. That's exactly why they're designed this way. So here's the thing. What are you going to have to practice? Multiplication and percentages. Because if you're using your calculator and something changes, you've got to be very quick to be able, to, and we practice this. We actually play a game in our office where we literally, it's almost like school, right? We have two people at the chalkboard and we're like, all right, go, right? And I'll be like, the house is 550, title insurance is $3,500. They owe $600 uh, or $65,000 on their mortgage um, and you know, whatever. And I'm like, go. That's how important it is. Because you do this part with confidence and they're like, man, this, this guy or gal has been doing this forever. This is a, this is a no brainer. We're good to go. Great, great question, right? So these are custom. We have these custom made, right? And we're going to explain to you how you can do that. So, so this entire presentation that I'm taking you through right now, we offer in our Brendan Bartik complete listing system, right? So you can actually go, you can have this exact thing. You can customize everything to yourself. Right? You can do everything is already done for you, right? Because I have a passion for having people have successful listing appointments. I'm not worried that you're going to walk in with the same. It has nothing to do with that. You know how many times I've walked into a listing presentation and I've been competing against anybody that was even close to the level of what I do? I would say 1% of the time, right? Now, most of you go, well, I don't even compete. I just sell my friends and family in my sphere. Well, think about this. 
charge them seven and a half percent commission. If we go back to these net sheets, the better your presentation is and the better value package you bring, I know plenty of agents that charge seven and a half, eight, nine, ten percent commission. So if you're doing just your uh, sphere, you can customize this to whatever it wants or to whatever you want it to be and explain to them that that's because you bring that much value. So maybe you do 7% and 5% if you sell it in-house. Maybe you're five, six, and seven, 5% in-house, 6% if they buy through and 7% if either of those two things happen. It's all up to you and the value you bring. So, uh, Anna, the link's in the... Yep, I have the link in the chat box and then I'll also post it on our Facebook page if you want it in the future as yeah, well. This, this will have sample marketing in it. It has these net sheets that you can customize. Uh, it has everything, right? Everything. So it's yes. an absolute powerhouse. You know, we've, we've received huge feedback from, from everybody on it. I think it'll help you quite a bit. Check it out. All right, so let's talk about your marketing plan of action. That's what I call it, marketing plan of action. Why don't I call it my listing presentations? Because the other thing sounds cooler. That's the only reason why, right? So when I go, hey, now let me take you through, John and Susie, our marketing plan of action. Sounds cheesy, it works, right? When I send them the hyperlink in a digital format, it says marketing plan of action if I'm doing a, um, a digital listing presentation as we were doing it through COVID, right? So in here, you're going to have pages with get to know us. This is much more for the um, pre-listing package, okay? Now, what you do and what you offer, okay? Yours will be different. You can customize this to anything you want. So, listing specialist, I'm your listing specialist. Listing manager, if you don't have one, you're the listing manager, right? You don't have to lie and be like, I have a listing manager or anything like this, or you can customize this and take this piece out, right? Transaction coordinator. If you're not using a transaction coordinator, I, I'll slap you through this, this presentation, right? Like I'm digitally smacking you in the back of the head going, you're so, so wasting so much time. You have to use a transaction coordinator unless you have an in-house one. Marketing, right? I think you do marketing. Inside sales agent. You probably don't have this. You are the inside sales agent, right? Not that you probably don't. Some of you on this call do. But if you don't have it, you're, you, you are it or take it out right? You could put here instead of inside sales agent, you could put here a uh, door knock uh, 200 homes in your neighborhood dropping off personal flyers. This is whatever your value is. When you're new, you have time. When you're bigger, you don't have as much time, so you need to leverage, right? And then client experience manager. Again, if you're building out this team, it doesn't have to be you. You can change this to whatever it is you want. Right? You could put your home inspector here. You could put your lender here, right? If they're buying through you, you could put whatever and just change the title. All this does is makes it look like you're awesome. That's the whole point, okay? Now, we broke this down into before we list, during we list, and after we list, right? So you can see here, it's very simple. You can customize this for whatever you're gonna do or not do, right? Staging, right? We offer a staging consultation, consultation, excuse me. So in our presentation, we have our stager. She comes over, does a consultation. I pay her 200 bucks. She meets with them. And then if they decide that they want to do actual staging, she upsells them and then does all the staging and they pay for it. It works out beautifully. We do it every day. Okay. So when we list, you can customize this to whatever you want to be doing, right? It's your value package. If you don't do all these things, then don't offer these things. But get creative with what you do offer, right? Can you sit there and make 500 phone calls to every agent? Can you do a, a bomb bomb email mailer? Can you do, think about it, can you, if it's a golf course community, can you take all the flyers to the local golf courses and make sure every pro shop knows about it? Think about what you can do that the other person won't. Okay. Your personal concierge service. People love this one. You are the personal concierge service. You are their Angie's list. So you can do all these things. And the word you're looking for here is I coordinate all of these things, right? So I coordinate. If you need a painter, a candle, you know, a, a, um, a handyman, or whatever it is, I can coordinate all that for you. Now here's the big one, secret sauce, 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you're not offering a 100% satisfaction guarantee, 
you're missing out on clients, right? So if at any time, Susie, you don't feel that I'm the right fit, you can unconditionally cancel our agreement at any time, unless of course we're under contract because we're moving forward to a successful close. Susie, I've built my entire business on integrity and trust, and I only want people working with me that want to be working with me. My other you know, competitors uh, try to put you into a six month, a 12 month agreement, and then hope and pray that somebody shows up and they lock you into that agreement because they're not gonna do anything to get your home sold. That's not what I do, okay? It's a powerful page. <clears throat> now, you have to have a page in your presentation that is the I'm not a scumbag page, okay? This talks about the charity that you're into, whatever you do for humanity. Um, you know, if you donate time to the Dumb Friends League, whatever it is, have a picture of a dog here. All of this you can customize. But this is very, very important to the high eye, right? They want to know who I am, not what I can do, right? So we raise over $400,000 a year for Third Way Center, which has five group homes across the front range. And by the way, I actually grew up in one of those group homes. So it's very, very dear to my heart. And so it's a passion of mine for every home we sell, a portion of that sale goes to the Third Way Center organization. It's a win-win. Right? We want win-wins. Do good, be good. Right? <clears throat> then you've got, don't take my word for it. Look what my other wonderful clients have said about me. Okay? Now, the last two pages that, um, that I don't see in here, but I'll just talk us through them, are what, would, what, what, what I call our transition to close pages. Okay? So the last two pages in the presentation are making the magic happen and what to do for showings, okay? Making the magic happen and what to do for showings. And here's that secret sauce close I was telling you about and here how, here's how it works, right? So you're down to these two pages. So here's what we need to do for photography, Susie and John. Um, so looking at the property, I made some notes. I break it down into three simple things before we get ready for photography. See what I'm already doing there? I'm assuming the close. So those three simple things are number one, we need to, and actually I'm going to stop the share here because I can, I want to talk about this. There we go. So number one, we're going to talk about, um, so three things we need to do. Number one is I need you to do a full, or excuse me, number one, we need to depersonalize. So I need you to go through the property, less is more. So we need to depersonalize. I know you love the National Rifle Association. I know you love Trump. Uh, that's awesome. And all of the pictures and the shrine to him, that's great. But we don't know if the buyer necessarily will. So we need to depersonalize. Number two, we need to declutter, right? So let's try to get as much out of here, either into the garage or into the trash as humanly possible. And that way we can make the place look bigger. We're selling square footage. And then number three, Susie, I need you to do a full 360 of the property and make sure that anything that anybody can operate functions and works properly. What I call a $5 fix, right? So again, if that squeaky door or that window doesn't close, because I wanna get you over asking price offers, so I don't want these little $5 issues holding up a big offer, okay? Now, the next page over to it is the what to do for showings. And here's the, here's the assumptive close, right? So now you're gonna see this page, right? And so now we call it setting the stage. So John and Susie, so for any showings that we have, here's the thing I always want you to remember. Light, bright, and smelling right. Light, bright, and smelling right. Okay? So in speaking of showings, Susie, John, who wants to be the first person uh, that we contact for all showings? Now, I take out my transition to close page, which is here. Okay? And I just start writing down, so he'd be like, oh, that's Julie. All right, Julie, you wanna be the first one for all showings, excellent. I start writing that down, okay, perfect, perfect. And let's talk about inclusions, exclusions. I know we talked about the wall-mounted TVs, we're gonna be leaving those, we're gonna be leaving the mount. All I'm doing is taking an order right now, and I'm assuming the close. I don't have to bring up that any of this. Now, if they object here, well, hey, hey, we're not ready to move forward with anything. I completely understand, John and Susie, I just wanna make sure I have all the information for when you, do or when you do decide to move forward with me that we're ready to rock and roll, okay? 
So I fill all of these things in. Do you want to have open houses? Yes, no. They don't really see this page. It's in my binder. And I'm just taking notes and I'm just reading down the thing. Now, additional notes, I need to know if they have 12 cats, six dogs, 10 things, uh, you know, all of that fun stuff. Those are the notes that I'm putting there. And I know we're, we're close on time, so I'm going to finish this out here pretty quickly. So now, after I have all of that, I break down with for them what's going to happen next. So great. So now that I have all that information, Susie and John, here's what this looks like. So basically, if today is, what's today, Tuesday? So if today is Tuesday, we're going to have photography. I want you to be able to take the weekend to get done all the things we talked about. We'll have photography set for Monday at 10 a.m., after photography is completed, I'm going to be able to give you a preview of what's, what the uh, property is going to look like online by Wednesday afternoon. So I want you to look at that, approve it. By Thursday morning, we're going to take that listing active for the weekend because we know that the most eyes that we have on the property um, on the internet are on Thursdays because buyers and agents are trying to set their showings for the weekend. Now, before COVID, then we would have our open house extravaganza. So John and Susie, then we're going to have our open house extravaganza on Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be amazing. We're going to spend the entire week calling all the agents and all the buyers. And then by Monday, we should have offers, if not multiple offers. And then from there, I'll take you through those offers so that you can have your home under contract, have your home back. Uh, uh, you won't be bothered with showings anymore. And we'll be on our way to successful closing. So now that we understand all of that, let me take you through our listing agreement. And then that way I can answer any questions. I always flip to this page first, which is the additional provisions page. This additional provisions page has the three provisions that I utilize in every listing agreement. So first of all is the 100% guarantee that the Pledge of the Barter Group will provide excellent service with the sale and marketing of your home. If at any time you want to cancel, you can. Number two, 5% if you purchase your number, another property through us and 4.5% if we sell it in-house. The reason I flip to this page first, and this is a pro tip, is because once I go through the pledge, the rest of this agreement is just a handshake because they can cancel it at any time. Does that make sense? I'm basically saying straight to this, the rest of this doesn't really matter because you can cancel at any time. But let me take you through it, John and Susie, just so you understand all the little intricacies, okay? Then I take them through it page by page. Then when I get to the sign page, it's already highlighted. This section's highlighted. All the little details that I want are highlighted. You know what's not highlighted? Commission, right? Don't need to highlight it. Just keep it moving, right? Then I get to the signature because I already went through net sheets with them. Why do I need to highlight how much I'm making? I get to the signature page. I go, great. So now we're all set. All I need right now is a signature right here where both of those highlights are next to your name and a key for the lockbox. And then I shut up. And it gets awkward. It can go two, three, seven minutes without them saying, they'll look at each other, look at me, look at each other, look at me, look at each other, right? And they're like, what do you think? I don't know. He's probably, he's pretty good. I don't know if he's going to leave or not if we don't sign it, right? And I'm just sitting there with this quirky look on my face, just going, mm hmm, whenever you're ready, right? But I'm not saying a word, okay? Now, they normally sign. If they don't, they're going to throw you an objection. You'll neutralize the objection, grab the pin again, put it back down do the same thing, sit there. So the objection would be, we want to have the night to think about it. I look them both dead in the eyes and I go, John, Susie, I can appreciate that you want to take some time to think about it. Do you feel that I can get your home sold? Well, yeah. Then let's go ahead and do the right thing and put me to work. Put the pin down again, look them in the eyes, shut up and sit there. So these closing techniques come from confidence. Now they're going to say, I get it, Brendan. We do think you can get our home sold, but we don't do anything until we sleep on it. I completely understand. And John and Susie, that's why I offer the 100% satisfaction guarantee. What we can do now, put me to work right now. Uh, again, sign the agreement. I'll go to work. You wake up tomorrow morning, two days from now, anytime and feel that I'm not the right fit for you. Call me up. We'll tear up this agreement. No harm done. And in fact, let me do you one better. I brought along a lockbox with me. I'll go ahead and leave the lockbox with you with the code. At the very least, if you decide that you still don't want to move forward with me, keep the lockbox as a gift from me to you. And that's it. And I've done that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And it works. So that's the reason these techniques are powerful. Remember, right? You can hear the music playing in your head. You only have one 
shot, right? You only have one shot to do this, to walk out of there with 10, 20, 30, 50, sometimes properties I've sold $100,000 or more in commission for that one sale, go for it, right? All right, so I know I'm a little bit over on time. I do wanna save some time for questions. What I always love doing is uh, on this class and everybody that's stuck in here with us, if there was one thing that you're gonna take action on as a result of this class, what are you gonna do, right? Put that in the chat box, right? Dedicate yourself from everything. Again, learning without implementation is stupidity. I know a lot of people that come to classes that don't do squat. Implement, right? Action changes things. So what's one thing that you're gonna do that's gonna change it. <clears throat> now, if you wanna take your game to a whole nother level, you're interested in elite one-on-one -on -one coaching, you wanna not only learn these skills, but all of the secret sauce that makes people some of the top producers and sell hundreds and hundreds of homes every single year, you know, feel free to get us more, or feel free to check us out. Uh, we'd love to have you a part of that process. And then as always, we thrive off of your feedback. So you will receive a survey after this. Please let me know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what you wanna see in the future. Uh, again, if you can give us a five-star review on Facebook or social media so we can help more people, we'd love to do that. And if you want a library of informational uh, things, check out our YouTube channel. We have a ton of resources on there, scripts, dialogues, role plays, CMAs, all kinds of things. And I'm very, very excited for you guys. And as always, I wish you great success. So I'm going to hang out for a second. If you have any questions, I will go through them now. And... What do we got? Perfect. So I'm going to kick things off. I've got a little list here. Uh, so can you, let's talk about objections and can you speak more on how to beat a Redfin agent in particular on commission splits? So to beat a, well, it, oh, that's easy. So it's the offering of what you have. So, so here's, here's that pitch. John, I can appreciate that the Redfin um, agent is offering a 1% commission or whatever their commission is. But John, your goal is to net the most money possible, correct? Right, you're gonna start saying that almost in every interaction. Your goal is to net the most money possible. So if you were to pay me $3,000 more to make $20,000 more on your house, would that be something you'd have interest in? They always say yes, because I'm always gonna keep them saying yes, right? So that's exactly what we bring to the table. If you list with that Redfin agent, they're gonna put your home on the MLS. You know what, if you're gonna list with Redfin, I'd be very honest with you, John, you might as well just be a for sale by owner. Just list it yourself, because you're gonna get the same value out of that. You're gonna get the same low ball offers. You're gonna get the same agents. Agents in my office won't even show a Redfin listing, John. Now I know that sounds unethical, but that's because they hate them and they wanna get paid the right amount for the work that they're putting into things. So they might not even show your house. You do want all the agents with all the buyers showing your house, correct? Of course you do, right? So, I mean, I have probably 30 for that one, but it's just picking it apart of going, the value isn't there, right? Do you think that Redfin agent for 1% is going to sit there and call the entire neighborhood? Are they gonna door knock your neighbors? Are they gonna do, are, whatever your value package is, remember, commission is solely determined by value, right? If I go to a, a, a beautiful, amazing steak restaurant, which, which I just did in Vail this weekend, right? And the stake is $60. I'm hoping that I'm going to receive a value during that experience to have a $60 stake instead of a $10 Applebee's stake. Stake's still the same, but value's very different in that experience, okay? So you've got to be very determined that when you look, like I said, this is your value proposition. Your marketing plan of action is your weapon to go six, seven, eight percent commission. Okay, if you include full turnkey staging, right? You do everything yourself. You can offer eight percent commission because you're doing all of these amazing things. If you're going to be offering to have the home professionally cleaned, right? I know agents that offer a professional home cleaning as part of their value package. You know, staging consultation, fixing lists, all of these different things. You can charge more. What else? Let's revisit the net sheets and let's talk about, do you always split the commission that way, the 3-2 and the 2-8? The 3-2 and the 2-8. Yes. 
Absolutely. Okay. So instead of three and three, right? And right. the reason if that question ever comes up and it rarely ever does because they care more about the net number is all of the expenses on the listing agent, right? So in, in here, the reason it's 3.2 and the buyer agent receives 2.8 2 is because I have all the hard cost, right? The brochures, the flyer, the internet marketing, the pay-per-click, the, whatever it is that you value and offer, all the buyer does is drive around and show the person houses. No offense, buyer agents. Awesome. So our friend Tyson asks, uh, if you get wet signatures, do you then follow up with electronic copies of contracts to get them to re-sign? Great question. Uh, so no and yes. So again, yes on wet signatures for the actual listing agreement, period, end of story. Scan that into whatever program you're using for your brokerage dot loop or, or whatever. Um, then I don't do disclosures ever at the table. I tell them, look, so after we're done, if you're a single agent, I'm going to be sending you a number of different disclosures uh, that'll have instruction on what you need to do to fill those out. I can call and talk to you through it if you need me to. I don't want to go through a whole bunch of documents, you know, square footage disclosure, seller's property disclosure. I want them to do that on their own. I just need a signature to put me to work right now. That signature puts me to work on your behalf right now, right? And then I just say, look, there'll be some more stuff coming. You can sign everything digitally, but you don't need to have that re-signed because you have a wet signature. Great question though, Tyson. It's a really good question. And then Terry kind of piggybacks uh, and says, do you ever have an electronic copy of the listing agreement as well as a hard copy so that you can enter the changes and have them sign on on the phone or do you prefer hard copy, write in what, what needs to be added and then have them sign right then and just scan it into ERS? Yep, so if you're talking about the listing agreement, there's very little that ever needs to be changed on it because I've already got it pre-filled out. The only thing that I'll ever possibly write into it are inclusions and exclusions, right? I can, I can scratch through and then I just initial and then I have them initial. For some reason, if, if, if I'm not able to secure the correct commission, we have to line through that, I just initial. Um, but those are really the only two inclusions and exclusions and commission amount are the only two that ever come up. Now in the listing agreement, I get a lot of questions about, well, you want to, so I put in there the dates for a six month listing. Now, the reason I do that is because I already have the 100% guarantee that I show them first before I go back to the dates. So they're like, well, why is it six months? Well, John, Susie, as I already told you, unlike my other, unlike most agents, you can cancel my agreement at any time. So the date is pointless. This is just so I can put it in MLS. So see how we're leveraging everything to kind of negotiate around it. But yeah, on that listing agreement, I'm, I line through, initial my little you know, BB next to it. I ask them to initial and I'm good to go. And then I send them everything else afterwards. Awesome. So um, we're, we're back on the net sheets. Uh, our friend Pete asks on the net sheet, if you don't include commissions off the gross, how do you explain that $20,000 hit to the net that you estimated for them? Well, it says right there, four and a half you know, uh, four and a half or six percent. I mean, that, that's as simple as I can explain it. I mean, that's why the, the commission amount is on there, but I don't have to explain to them the detailed number because I'm already telling them what they're paying. They're paying either four and a half, five or six, period, end of story. What they care about and what I legally have to disclose to them is what they're walking away with, their estimated net proceeds. And I always follow that up with, especially with that document, this is just an estimate. I can get you the to the penny one directly from the title company that'll have every little thing. So on mine, I always put a little buffer in title insurance to cover uh, for, um, uh, the closing service fee. Sorry, I was trying to think of the name of it. So I always put a little bit extra in my title insurance policy to cover closing service fee and anything else miscellaneous. I always put like an extra 300 bucks in there. Because again, when they see that estimated one from the, the, the title insurance company, I don't want them ticked off at me because they're like, well, you told me we were going to be walking at this and now really it's this. So yeah, great question. I always put a little extra fluff in there but I try to keep it very basic in that it's just an estimate, right? This is very much just like very convenient, very talking it through. I don't want to sit there for 20 minutes going through estimated net sheets. I just want to go, you get it, right? You're going to be walking away at about this, at this. And I, you know, I charge four and a half, five or six. Any other questions, Susie or John? Keep it moving. 
So this is, hard, this is hard for all the S and C's on this call because they're like, but wait, Brendan, I'm a high S, I'm a high C. Maybe I'm not quite getting this. So four point, you see what I'm saying? So you can already see why the disc is important because you're trying to figure this out, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so the, the conversation in the chat box is just <clears throat> really wanting to understand why offer a variable commission structure of four and a half, five, and six, and really just trying to immerse themselves in that language. Beautiful, yeah. So every seller on earth wants to believe that they're going to receive the lower commission, the four and a half percent. Now you could do four, five, and six. You could do five, six, and seven. People love variables. And here's the thing with the four and a half. John, when we sell it in-house, I win and you win. So of course I'm going to be working that much harder to get you the four and a half percent. Do you see how that conversation happens? So when they come back and they go, well, so-and-so, you know, you know, John Ding Dong Real Estate told me that they'll do it for four and a half percent period. I understand. I completely understand, John, and I understand that. Let me ask you a question, John. If that other agent was so quick to negotiate their commission down, right, right out of the gate, then they're obviously not going to do anything to help you sell your home, right? And what do you think is going to happen when they get an offer on your house? Okay, I'm going to still be giving you the same level of service that I would for 6% at 4.5% as long as we procure the buyer, right? And you do want full service, correct? Because you want as many buyers seeing your home as humanly possible because we know more exposure, more buyers means higher offers and more money for you, correct? You know, what's, you know what John's going to do for 4% or 4.5%? He's going to put it on the internet and hope and pray that somebody shows up and that you don't fire him before he gets a price reduction. Is that what you want? John, if that's what you want, you might as well just sell it yourself and not even waste your time with the other person because you're going to get the same result. Nothing. Now shut up and sign here. No, just kidding. Right? But yes, that is exactly right. The con that was a joke. I know, I know. Right? But that's, that's the funny part of that, right? Is you've got to remember, remember, if I can say it a hundred times, value, value, value. I get very few commission objections, if ever, because they go, wow, the value is there. And I might get four and a half percent if he brings the buyer, which is awesome because he's doing all this stuff. So he's probably going to procure the buyer. So it's a great question. Yeah. on the variable commission. Uh, I studied this over and over and over. So let's, let's do this in a role play. So, um, so, well, I, and well, it'll be hard to do this. So let's just say that Anna said to me, Brendan, what do you charge for a commission? I go 6%. Does that sound better? Or do if I, if Anna goes, what do you charge for a commission? I go, actually, when we procure the buyer, total commissions reduced all the way down to four and a half percent. If you purchase your next property through us, commission is 5%. And if for some bizarre reason you move to Alaska and neither of those two things happen, then it's our traditional commission of 6%. Which one sounds better? because all I dinged them on was the four and a half percent, right? They're always going to think about the lowest number first. And when you're displaying this, when you're in the presentation with them, you always start with four and a half percent first. You end up at six and you go, for some bizarre reason, if we're not able to sell it in-house, here you go. Great question though. Yeah, there's some really good ones. Uh, Terry asks, mm -hmm. just as a follow-up, what about the seller advisory? Do you always send that later on? Always. Nothing else is signed at the table except the listing agreement. Now, again, I always have to disclose, check with your local, you know, board or employing broker. I can only tell you, you know, what I do and I'm, I, I think it's legal, but again, if you're in another state and I know we have people on here, you know, do whatever is legal, uh, of course, first, but I can tell you I've done this, done it this way a thousand plus times, never had an issue. And is it recommendable to put those commission percentages in the listing presentation themselves? Never. Absolutely not. Yeah. Remember in your pre-listing package, your pre-listing package is all about why I'm great. We don't ever talk about how much I, how much I charge, right? It's I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. And when I get there, based on our conversation and even in our role play in the prequel. So Brendan, before you come over, man, hey, we're not gonna do anything unless we're really looking for a discount broker for 4%. All right, I completely appreciate that, John. Well, at this point, I haven't seen the home 
and I want to make sure I can actually help you. So I'd like to come by, take a look at the property. I'm going to send you some information ahead of time that explains what we do and how we get it done. And then based upon our conversation, we can discuss the commission. Does that, does that sound fair? I'll be in your neighborhood this afternoon today at four or is tomorrow at one better for you? Right? Mm -hmm. I can't determine commission until I've seen the property. I don't know what the situation is. If he wants to list the property, if I go in there at 500,000 and I don't tell him that I think it's 500,000, well, there was a big piece that we didn't talk about either. I never tell them what I think it should sell for. It's always what the market's willing to bear. But let's say that I walk in there and I, I know that it'll sell for 500. And he goes, Brendan, I just want to be done with this house. I want to list it at 450. I don't even pull out net sheets. I go, awesome. I just talk to him about it verbally so I don't have to get into all these numbers. And I tell him 450 is awesome. If he goes, well, Brendan, would you do it at 450 and 4.5% or 4%? That's a business decision. I go, this guy's going to sell this thing $50,000 under market value. I'm going to have multiple offers within five minutes. Am I willing to do that for six grand? The answer for me usually is yes, <laughs> right? Like commission is all fluid dependent upon how much I have to spend in work and how realistic they are on pricing. It's a business decision. That's where people get caught up into this. There's no, there's no one size fits all. It's when you get really good at this, it's, it's always the reason four and a half, five and six exist is because I always usually end up getting six, right? There's obviously times that we do sell it in house and it does happen. So I'm not lying about it. And there's plenty of times, you know, you could also roll the dice. Let's say that you're a Coldwell Banker agent or a Remax agent. You could say, you could roll the dice and say, if a Remax agent from all of Remax brings the buyer, I'll do it for X. It doesn't have to be your team. And they'll be like, so all of Remax, if they bring the buyer, yeah, and we're huge. We've got blah, blah, blah. Or if you're whatever size, blah, blah, blah. Because it makes them feel special. They're like, well, man, the odds of that happening are pretty darn good. The odds of a Remax agent buying, being the listing buyer agent on another Remax property, it's like 2%. It's a 2% chance. Our friend Phyllis uh, asks, are you ethically responsible to tell them that the market is pricing a property higher or, and, and that they could get more? So back to that previous example, 450 versus 500. Not at all. Yeah, in your listing agreement, if you read your seller advisor or your, um, uh, yeah, the, the responsibilities of the agent, right? All you're doing is if they want it, there's nowhere in there that says, I have to get them a select price, right? it says that I'll sell it at a price that they feel comfortable with, right? Or it doesn't, I'm, don't hold me to that verbiage either, right? So a lot of times I'm working for, so I'm working for the seller, right? They wanna sell the property at a certain price. My responsibility is to get them that price. That's probably the better way I can say it, right? So that's why I ask a lot of questions instead of shoving my opinion down their throat because now on the other side of that, I'm also trying to protect them if they think the price is $100,000 more than what the market's willing to bear. It's my responsibility as a professional listing consultant to explain to them why that's not going to make logical sense, right? But here's the one thing we know. Here, well, that was a great question, Phyllis. And let me explain this in another way. What are the two things that sell properties? There you go, Landon. Price and time. Right? That's the only two things on this planet that sell homes. If I price it at a certain price, it will sell. And if I give that price enough time, it will sell. So with that seller question about this, if we put it at 450 and he gets multiple bidding offers up to 480, 490, 500, is he going to be happy with me? Because the market set the price for the property, not me. The buyers set the market price. If I sit there and go, hey, based on the comps, you should be listing at it at this, I never say that. I go, market value is here. Now, if I'm talking to him and he goes, hey, I want it done, I love it, right? I love it. It's a great question. What yeah. Else? So uh, last one, our buddy Tyson asks, what's your close rate? Oh, well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Well, I'll, I'll preface that by two, two different things, right? When, when I was in full speed and, and again, you know, selling 130 homes myself personally year after year, right? And those, those being 95% listings, um, I was probably, not probably, I was probably like right around 85%, right? 
Now, when I say that, I always preface that because of two things. A lot of times I would turn the seller down, right? I would turn the seller down in the fact of they weren't realistic. The condition was ridiculous. The parameters of what they wanted made no logical sense, right? So they'd be like, look, we have six uh, Great Danes. They're going to be here the entire time. My grandma's going to sit on the front porch while you're selling it, uh, smoking cigarettes. And we want to list it for $50,000 over market value. No, thank you. Have a great day, right? <laughs> Excellent, right? I think a lot of these times, it's the same thing like dating. We try to take these people and make them something they're not. If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's a duck, right? Get out. So when you're asking about conversion, I hear people go, you'll hear agents about, I have a 99.3% conversion rate. Cool, I'm getting signatures because that doesn't tell the whole story on how many you sold if those properties ever ended up selling, right? I also would be more proud of my list price to sales price ratio, right? Mine's 102.3%, meaning on average, whatever I list at, and this is again with kind of Phyllis's question, I'd rather have a list price to sales price ratio that's positive, right? I get my sellers on average 2.3% more than not, than list properties really high and get them 96% list price to sales price ratio. I always want to position myself to be a hero because again, the market sets the value for the homes, not my personal opinion, right? How many times have you listed a house and you thought this thing was going to sell like in seconds? I just had a conversation with one of my clients I coach. They were like, Brendan, I don't know. I'm lost, right? I listed it at this thing. I thought we were going to have multiple offers. I'm so surprised because the market didn't feel it was worth that amount, even though you thought it was worth X. You're not, there is no pricing expert. There is no master of pricing. We're putting a fictitious number on a property to attract buyers to it in the hope of them making an offer. That's a super gray area, right? Otherwise every house would just sell boop, 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 right? It would be like super easy, like ding, ding, ding. We don't know because every single property has different variations. If that one house that I list smells like cat pee and the neighbor didn't smell like cat pee, that house is going to fetch more, but without smelling the cat pee, you would never know why. Great question. What else? I think that's it. Uh, folks, if you have any final comments or questions, now is the time before we wrap up. Brendan, any final thoughts on your side? Yeah, just final thoughts is, this is one piece of the puzzle, right? So this is a list like a boss. The, there is, you know, again, how to find, list, and sell 100 homes that we teach. Right? when we're looking at those classes, each one of these pieces in their individual, uh, when you're looking at them individually, plays into a bigger overall real estate career. And the people that I know that have the most success take each one of those pieces and building blocks on top of them, right? So right now, if you don't have, if you're not you know, you know, even ready to go on a listing appointment, you should be spending time getting this prepared right? So you're ready to rock and roll when the time comes. Then you're going to feel that much more confident when you go on the appointment and when you're setting appointments on the phone, right? So every piece falls into the next, right? So that would be the biggest thing. And then the other thing is practice, 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 practice. In the mirror, with a friend, on a car hood, just kidding. Wherever you're doing it, do it all the time. Practice as much as you possibly can and, and you'll have great success. Cool. All, right. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Like I said, please leave us a kind review. It means the world to me. Check us out on YouTube. And if there's anything I can do for you personally, call or email me or Anna and we'll do everything we can. Take care.